Thank you for your singing. Does anyone have anything on their hearts they're like needing to share this morning? If not, Mark chapter 6 is where we'll be. Mark chapter 6. Earlier this week, I had been reading in the book of Zephaniah, and the Lord was speaking to me from that book, and, and I wondered if that might be where the message needed to be today, and it was kind of a message of, of oh, a little bit revival, a little bit evangelistic, and quite a bit of outreach. And I was bemoaning to the Lord after that, about how it seemed that every message lately had been on outreach. Just outreach and outreach and outreach. I looked back to see if it had been or has been, and it, it hasn't, but it does feel that way to me. And so I was telling the Lord, isn't there anything you'd have us to preach from the Gospels, things that Jesus said? And immediately, the words from Matthew 5 come to mind. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Even Jesus was into outreach. And so I wasn't overly surprised when the message today came from Jesus' words in Mark chapter 6, verse 37. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Now this is the account of feeding of the 5,000. It's also recorded in Matthew 14 and also in Luke 9. And so let's read about it. Mark chapter 6 now, back up in verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. The disciples have gathered to Jesus and, and they've told him what they've been up to, what's been accomplished. You see, earlier in this chapter, we, we were told what they had been assigned. Back up to verse 7. And he called unto, them the, unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and, put on, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust from under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. The twelve had been busy and now they've come back and gathered uh, together unto Jesus and told him all the things that they had done and, and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Now verse 33, And when the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fishes he divided among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. 
We've known this story since our days in Sunday school. We've known that Jesus would command, give ye them to eat. And we've known that he would multiply the loaves and fishes. But the 12 did not know it. They were living through it and learning it as they went. So what did they learn and experience that can help us? Go back to verse 30. The disciples had gathered themselves back to Jesus. Since they had been doing what they were told, they had been out on a, a mission for him. They, they had no fear. There was no condemnation in coming to Jesus. They came and gave a report, told him all that they had done. For us, that's not necessary. He knows. In fact, a record is being kept. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And also in Hebrews 6.10 it says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do ministers. But the disciples, they gave an accounting. In verse 31, uh, he said unto them, Come ye apart. Jesus invites the busy twelve to a quiet place to regroup, a place to rest. For the disciples, all their work has been done in groups of two done without Jesus present. And so they needed a recharge to be with Jesus, to hear more, to learn, to fellowship, to abide with him. For us, that is not the case. We have the paraclete, the alongside helper, the Holy Ghost, if we'll let him be with us. It is possible in a super busy season of our lives to lose fellowship, to get drier, to become lukewarm, if we may borrow a cliche. We must make it a priority to be with him, to abide with him. In verse 32, they departed. They accepted his invitation for an intimate renewal period, a revival per se. Verse 33, we note that the crowd knew where he was and where he was going. And so when the ship came in, the folks were already there. You know, it does not matter where we go. We'll find people with needs there. The store, it, it doesn't matter. Where we go, we'll find people with needs. And so the alone time that the disciples had had with Jesus on the boat was all the experience they would have of just them, just that intimate group. Hopefully they had used it wisely. And the question came to my mind, do we use our times of refreshing wisely? What was it about 10 days ago that IHC happened and how many people went to IHC only concerned with it being a dress parade? Mama can wear a pink skirt and Papa can wear a pink necktie and the little kids will all color coordinate. And so it's a dress parade. Do you think that kind of person got sufficiently recharged and revived when they were there? Or what about camp meeting? We go to camp meeting in Independence or Redwood. We need a little time of, of recharging. And we gripe about the hot weather and the hard benches and the horrific chow lines and the howling children. Are we getting recharged? Are we using our time wisely when we are with Jesus? There isn't a lot of time in our busy lives. The responsibilities and the necessities arrive faster than our boat. Are we making good use of our time? God help me to, to do better in time management. And so verse 34 now, and they've, they've arrived at the, the desert place, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people. They arrived here, and it was supposed to be deserted, and they found it crawling with folks. And Jesus had compassion on them because he saw their helpless condition. Think of the damage that would have been done had Jesus been selfish with his time or with his plan or with the relationship with the, with the disciples. Self will always ruin a good thing. I was reading a book this week called The Walking Preacher of the Ozarks. Has anybody heard of it? Guy Howard. He, he was telling about a church they were fixing to build. An acre of ground had been donated, and they had the timber laying there, and they laid the foundation. And he said somewhere after the foundation and before the wood went up, self got involved. And he said, if you'll drive such and such a road and look over to the right, You'll see a, a foundation and a pile of rotting timber. Self will always ruin a good thing. 
Surely we hope that the 12 disciples are learning that never let an opportunity go to waste since Jesus is beginning to teach them many things there in verse 34. Now in the first part of verse 35, we note that when the day was far spent, you know, ministry takes time. As we're dealing with people, it cannot be done in a rush. It's got to be done in an appropriate pace. And in the second half of that, verse 35, we note that uh, even though Jesus had not been concerned with the time, his disciples were. The disciples were looking at the desert and the clock and not the more e urgent need of the people's souls. Think about that. Looking at the clock and the surroundings and not the needs of the people. That's what the disciples were up to. And so in verse 36, they say to Jesus, Send them away and let them by. They had their plan. We're going to have Sunday school at 10. We're going to have worship at 11. We're going to be at Bob Evans by half past noon. Then we're going to have a nap and we're going to be back to church at 630. Or if our favorite team is playing, it's been a busy week and next week's going to be bad. We'll just stay at the house and relax. If people won't get saved and get their act together and go from worldly to conservative, from fun to frowns, all by supper time, let them go. Send them away. Let them fend for their self. The disciples seemingly had no concern for the crowd's ability to pay or buy food. They'd certainly seen the need. They knew there was no bread to eat. But it wasn't a major concern of theirs. Their attitude was, send them away. Let them buy. People have come into this church. Paul and Philip sat one row above Evan. That lady from Central America who come and looked in the door recently. And we see they have a need, and we give them a buck and send them away. Now granted, it really isn't that bad, but occasionally some will stay for service and others are invited to. But you see the point. Needs, and we know people have needs. And we may know generally what their need is or specifically what their need is. But too often, my response has been, go and fend for yourself. Here's a little help, here's a little idea, but go. I don't want to spend my time on you. Figuratively, that's us, but literally, that's what the disciples did. The same 12 that had just returned from a two-by-two -two trip where they had preached and healed and cast out devils and taught. To them, it was Jesus that said, verse 37, Give ye them to eat. The disciples hear the command, and so they instantly obey. No, the Bible says, And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Instead of instant obedience, they question the cost. There is nothing new under the sun. We think we need to go teach people and we, quite, we wonder how much money is it going to take to buy material. Go preach. Well, that'll cost me my career. Go gather up Sunday school kids and call on Saturday. You know, that'll cost my time. Go witness to them. No, that'll cost my comfort. And all we appear to care about is the cost. Who cares about the cost? Time does not matter to God, and money does not matter to God. And may I, may I say at the risk of sounding harsh that our squishy, knobbly need feelings don't matter to God. He said give them to eat, and he meant give them to eat. Obey. Obey. One of the kids yesterday, Heidi gave a command, and you know what the response was? I won't tell which kid. But the response was, I don't have to. When it was over, they knew they did have to. Obey. This business of winning souls to Christ, being light and salt and the hands and feet of Jesus, is not just preaching material. It is a command meant to be obeyed. And while they're worried about the cost... Jesus asks them in verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go and find out. You know, that's not a bad thing for us as Christians to do. Find out what we have that can be used to meet needs. 
And when you look, you'll have three things. You'll have time, and you'll have treasure, and you'll have talent. All of us here have 24 hours in a day. All of us here have treasure. Some of us have more, and some of us have less. How can we use our treasure for Jesus? And all of us here have talent. Some more, some less. How can we use it for Jesus? We need to do an honest evaluation of ourselves. Ask God for help. Lord, what do we have that you can use for your benefit and to help others? They did a quick look and they discovered five loaves and two fishes. They had more loaves than fishes. And you know, there are instances when we'll have more time than treasure. Or we may have more talent than time. Or we may have more treasure than talent. And not only will we have more and less at different times, the circumstances are fluid. At different times in our life, in different seasons, we'll have, have more of one and less of another. It'll just, it'll fluctuate. Keep track of what you have to be used for Jesus. Now in verses 39 and 40, he commands them to sit down by companies, and they sat down by, in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. There was order to this event. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says that, For God is not the author of confusion. At other times we read that Jesus went apart to pray. There is an order and a neatness to things of God. I'm convinced that randomness and racket isn't going to help people. There needs to be order. Jesus in his parable of the soils described the briars and, uh, as calling attention to the cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches. If those things can ruin a Christian, does it not stand to reason that they could prevent somebody from becoming a Christian? And so we too need to be orderly in helping others. And I know that is easier said than done, and I don't exactly know how to do it. But I know William Booth figured it out and created the Salvation Army and changed the London and some of the world. And John Wesley figured it out, and, and they were mocked as having such a method that they were called Methodists. And in his time, before worldliness crept in, they too changed the world. Order. We need an order in our outreach. Now in the first part of verse 41, we note that when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed. Everything is vain unless the Lord helps. The psalmist said, except the Lord build the house, ye labor in vain. The songwriter said, little as much if God is in it. Now the second half it said, and he break the loaves. Why did Jesus break the loaves? Why didn't he just give every guy a whole loaf? Why did he just give him pieces? Scripture says that Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. Another place we read that it's good for me that I've been afflicted. Paul said that Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient. Efficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, we may need some breaking before we can meet the needs of others. It may be good for us to experience loss or sickness or grief or poverty or infertility or tragedy so that we can help others. Do we ask for it? No. But God is faithful and he won't put more on us than we need or can handle so that we can use it for his glory. Verse 42, they did all eat and were filled. We note that order plus their ability plus blessing plus breaking equals fullness. I'm convinced the formula will still work. So they had the things uh, were in order and they added to what we collectively have, added to God's blessing, added to God's breaking if necessary equals fullness, fullness of joy and salvation and hope and etc. Verse 43, we note that not only were they full, but there were leftovers. You know, there's going to be enough that we can keep on giving and giving. And if we need to give some more to the guy that had, had a first round, we can, we can do that. And then in verse 44, we note the climax that they that did eat were 5,000 men. Just a little bit, hardly enough to keep a bird alive. They fed 5,000 men, or, or God did. Our God is a big God. He can and he will and he does meet needs, but it's done his way. So does this help our faith this morning? God can use us to meet needs. He has commanded us to give, to reach out. Don't worry about the cost, just obey and watch him work. 
So why do we struggle? Why are we concerned about it costing too much or making me get out of my comfort zone? Why are we concerned about that? Turn over two chapters now to Mark chapter 8. Verse 1 says, In those days, the multitude being very great, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them come from afar. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Did you notice verse 4? The disciples asked, from whence can a man satisfy these men? How can we satisfy? And so it's obvious they either did not learn or they quickly forgot. The apple didn't fall far from the tree, does it? We all, or maybe it's just me, need the reminder that in life we're going to be busy doing for Jesus and we'll want a reprieve, we'll want a break, and, and we may get one, but there's going to be people we meet with a need or a hunger. When we've identified the need, don't worry about the cost. Don't send them away to fend for themselves. Ask by prayer, Lord, what can I do or give or be to meet this need? And when we know, obey and give and give and give. And Jesus can make up the difference if we'll obey to reach souls and help others. You see, 2 Corinthians 8.12 says, If there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Mark 6.37, He answered and said unto them, Give. Let's stand.